Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. The Arabic expression, mashallah, which means what God wills or what God desires has happened, may be the best chance English speakers have at unlocking the spirit of Luke's use of the Greek term evdokia. The latter also pertains to the completion of God's will what God desires by fiat, and his good pleasure in the biblical story in opposition to the will of Caesar. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 460 of the Bible as Literature podcast. There is a beautiful expression in Arabic, mashallah. It's an expression that people use when they see something beautiful. It refers to the desire of God. Learn this expression, because if you don't, you will not understand what Luke is talking about in today's passage. We did a little word study because there are examples, multiple examples in Hebrew, where we hear about God's desire. Certainly in Isaiah 53, there is the famous passage where it is God's desire to bruise, to crush the suffering servant. But it's a different term in Hebrew than the term that Luke uses, at least if you pay close attention to the way that the Septuagint handles the Greek. The term that corresponds to the Lucan Evdokia is the Hebrew rason, which corresponds to this idea of desire in the Arabic expression, mashallah, what God desires. Now, to understand how things have been unfolding in the Gospel of Luke, we've said many times that there is the Lucan account of these things that he is addressing to Theophilus, and then there is Luke's anti-history in which his character, Caesar Augustus, is trying to impose what he desires, what his will is, But now, with the appearance of the biblical shepherds of Israel, in opposition to the desire of Caesar, we are now going to see what God desires unfold. Now, when we as human beings use the expression, mashallah, we're talking usually about something vain, like a beautiful painting or something that we've created with human hands. If we are being more godly, we'll say it when there's a beautiful child or some beautiful thing that happens between people, like an exchange of affection or kindness. But here in Luke, when we talk about what God desires, we are talking about the completion or the execution of his will. So from the outset, I want to make it clear in the minds of our listeners that it's not about God being pleased with human beings. If that's what you think, when we get to that famous doxology of Christmas, glory to God in the highest, if you think that it's about his happiness with the human race, then you're not hearing scripture, you're hearing Western anthropocentrism and humanism, and you're going away singing Christmas carols on Christmas Eve, feeling really good about being a human being, 
which is nice and feels great, but it's not the Gospel of Luke. So far, the Lord has been flexing his muscles to show that what he wants to have happen is going to happen. I love the story of Zacharias because that's exactly what he's been doing. He says, okay, anyone believes you, we're going to make sure you stop talking. And then you won't have anything to say. No one's going to believe you. Okay, then I'm going to tell you exactly what to say. And he tells them what he's going to say. And it happens to be at a time when everyone else is trying to put words in his mouth, namely when he's trying to name his son. And Zechariah just states the statement that the Lord gave him, and then he's allowed to speak. Only if Zechariah is speaking according to the desire of God, then he's allowed to speak. When Women are not able to have children according to nature. God imposes his will, and they have children. God is constantly flexing his muscles to show what is going to happen. We spent a lot of time on this one, Father, really understanding what it means for the desire of the Lord. What exactly does this mean? And the example that came to my mind is, you know, if you're in a work setting and you don't like what your boss is doing, you have a desire that your boss would change his ways. But if you're the boss and you don't like what your employer, your associate is doing, you have a desire that he act differently, but you have a duty to change the situation. The desire of the senior is more important and is going to be manifested in a way that the desire of the junior is not. There's a very big difference between the desire of every living thing and the desire of God. They're entirely different things, even though we use the same word desire, okay, because they function completely differently. Now, we've talked a lot about the will of the father, the will of the senior, the will of the shepherd, and we're using this word desire today because it keeps coming up. We have some different Greek words, and we have some different Hebrew words, and we're trying to bring that out, but it really does relate to the same notion that the desire, the will of the senior is going to be manifested, and if they don't, they're not functioning as leader. So that's why when we have this face-off between Caesar Augustus and the Lord in Luke, the way that God shows that he is the Lord and not Caesar is he keeps imposing his will on reality in a way that Caesar can't counter. You know, Father Paul and Tarazi Tuesdays, he's been talking a lot about Moses versus Pharaoh. And when the magicians can manifest the same thing as Moses, like with their sticks turning into serpents. Everyone's like, well, okay, I guess they're the same until Moses's eat the magician's staffs slash snakes. Then once the magicians can't do what Moses is able to do, then you see, ah, so Pharaoh is not able to manifest his desire, but the Lord is continuing to manifest his desire. This is the fight of Elijah between the Baals and the Lord. Can they devour their own offerings? Well, let's see. Who can impose their desire on the situation? Oh, looks like it was the Lord one more time. Okay, the Lord wins again. But the way that the Lord challenges the people is to say, whatever your will is, you think you can hold your money? You think you can hold the protection of your city in your own hands? I challenge that and we'll see whose desire is manifested. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. There it is, the shepherds of Israel keeping watch over their flocks. This is in opposition to and under the nose of the tyranny of Caesar Augustus. Notice It's not just under the nose of Richard, but in defiance of. Because while everybody else, including Mary and Joseph, are running around trying to get back to their supposed city of origin to be counted, the shepherds are remaining in the wilderness, caring for their flocks and paying attention to the voice from the heavens. The shepherds in Luke are picking up exactly where we left off at the beginning of the New Testament at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Here we are in Luke chapter 2, and we are already in the kingdom of the heavens. So don't believe it 
When a religious leader tells you, go to war, die for your country so that you can enter the kingdom of the heavens, that is a bald-faced lie. That is the lie of the ages. That is the lie of Caesar. That is the lie of tyranny and fanaticism. That is the lie of religion and state, which are the same thing, according to the authors of the Bible. Hear the voice from the heavens through the shebet of the shepherd, who, when Caesar imposes his will, remains in the wilderness, caring for his flock by night, under the nose of the oppressor. This word, agravlundes, living in the field, there's actually a verb of them living in the field. It's only used this one time, and Luke, I would love to do more work on some of these words because this idea that there's something specific about these shepherds that they're out in the wilderness. And I always like how, you know, in the prophets, the kings, the rulers are often referred to as shepherds. I always think of this image as those rulers who are functioning correctly are the ones who are abiding in the field and the ones who are going to be noticing what's going on, the ones who are going to be paying attention to God's desire being manifested. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now here's the thing about the commandment not to be afraid. They are defying Caesar Augustus, by ignoring, and here's the beauty about being a shepherd, which is like being a pirate or a bandit, or a country bumpkin, for that matter, from the perspective of the ideological centers of human tyranny, which you call civilization. You're not afraid of those in power, but here you are afraid of the messenger of the Lord of hosts and the God of Israel. You are afraid of Elohim, who is sending the angels to stand before you. And this term stand is a technical term. It's paschal. The root is esteemi. So they are standing in judgment for all time, proclaiming the good news. This is what's happening before the birth of Christ, and that is the position that Jesus Christ will be in on the day of his being raised by the Spirit, by the right hand of God the Father. So this is also a kind of a judgment scene in the terminology of the Greek. What do you mean, Father Mark, the angel just stood before them? No, this is a judgment scene. The gospel is being preached the angel is being stood up to announce the judgment. There's a reason to be afraid. C.S. Lewis is wrong. It's not because angels were scary. It's because the gospel is being preached to men who don't fear Caesar, but who fear the word. It's beautiful, which means that their reference, their reference for the kingship of Jesus and for the authority of his reign has nothing to do with an earthly line. So in this sense, we're now talking about a different functional David when the angels speak to the shepherds. Yes, there is generally fear when an angel appears, but you're right, an angel, their job is to bring a message. And the glory of the Lord shining is what gives them the idea that something is up, and that's what they're afraid of. But, you know, we've said this since Mark, that the people are generally afraid for the wrong reasons. They're afraid because this angel showed up, but that's not the angel's role is not to show up and scare people. He's not a ghost <laughs> going to jump out and say boo. 
right? And that when you say it's proclaim the gospel, that's exactly what he says. Idugar evangelizome. Behold, I am evangelizing. Evangelizome. In Greek, this sounds a lot more interesting because it's angelos gar evangelizome. So it's the verb that comes from the same noun as angel because the angel is sending the message. So I am here to proclaim this message. I am here to evangelize. Literally, behold, I am evangelizing to you a great joy. Now, the idea that oh no, shepherds, you're supposed to stop feeling afraid and feel happy. That's not necessarily the case because whose joy is it? It's the good pleasure of the Lord. We know that. We know that the Lord is manifesting his desire. And so it's a great joy for him. So he can say to the shepherds, rejoice because you know that I'm in control. You know that when I deliver a message, it happens. I've been talking about this Since Mary's cousin got pregnant, I've been saying something like this is going to happen, and here it is. Behold, idu. So the desire of the Lord being manifested is good news. Now, we know that it's not good news for everybody. We know that it's bad news for a lot of people. You know, behold, I'm bringing you a great joy. Really? Is this great joy to Caesar Augustus? No. This is neither good nor joy. For Caesar Augustus. That is how we know it is the great joy of the Lord, not of human beings. It's not saying everybody now be happy. Now, President of the United States, be happy. I'm evangelizing you. No, no, not good news if you're the President of the United States, because it means that there's somebody who's higher than you and all of your sins are going to be brought to light. And no, no President of the United States wants that to happen. This is not great joy for them. So whose great joy is it? not the people's. It is the Lord's because his will is being manifested. And if you happen to be on his side, okay, good. It'll be great joy for you too. But eh, we've talked about that before. You're likely only in your imagination on his side, but not actually in your deeds. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Beautiful. This is the sign that there will be a young child that will dwell among you in the setting in which you normally find yourself as a shepherd, among your flocks, and you will recognize him. The sign of God's great desire being manifested through evangelizing a great joy is that you're going to find a baby. Eh. Uh, Not so interesting. But this baby's going to be in a manger. Okay, that's just strange. A feeding trough, as we discussed, where the flocks normally dwell. So it's in a shepherding setting. You'll recognize it. He's one of you. He'll be right there with the rest of your flocks. Exactly. So as soon as you see a baby in a feeding trough, you'll understand it. Now, after seeing the glory of the Lord coming manifest in this angel, it's like now you're going to see a baby and he's going to be in a trough. That's strange, but it's also kind of interesting if you think of the parallel of Moses being found in an ark, as technically the word is, which is, you know, a little boat in the water, and that's how you found the messenger of the Lord, the teacher of the Lord's Torah. You found him as a baby in a little boat, okay? So this is how you're going to find him, and this is where you're going to be. But yeah, the connection between the shepherds and the fact that this baby is going to be sleeping where the flock would sleep, where the animals would be eating and sleeping and taking shelter, this is where this child is going to be. That's how you're going to recognize him. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Doxa en ifsistis theu ke epigisirinin en anthropis evdokias. I wanted to read the Greek because I just am so uncomfortable with the English translation, because no matter how they twist this verse, it always comes out pertaining to the human beings and not to the will of God, but we explain from the outset 
that the glory is to the one who reigns in the highest. That is the reference in the verse. He sits in the heights, and his kingdom rules over all. Anybody who grew up hearing the Psalter and reciting it is very comfortable with the way that this verse unfolds in their ears and understands the language of this verse, even in English. There is one God who sits in the heavens. He is pleased with the way things are unfolding. It is what he desires. He desires things to be according to his will. That is what peace on earth means. It means everybody does what he wants and keeps quiet at his table. It means that his will is playing out the way he sees fit. It's what he desires. There's no argument. There's no dispute. He's pleased that the shepherds not only defy Caesar, but listen to his message through his messengers, the angels. He's pleased that his will is being completed, perfected in the birth of Jesus Christ. He's pleased that despite the disobedience of the temple priesthood, in the end, things are working out according to his desire. That is why there is peace among men, and that is why someone hearing this text can make that expression, mashallah, this is what God desires. That is what Luke is saying. So the pleasure here pertains to the will of God. It refers to the will of God. It is what God wants. It has nothing to do with him being happy with humanity. Not at all. He's happy with himself. That is the trick in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Syntactically, this verse is tricky because goodwill is genitive. So whose goodwill are we talking about? Whose evdokia are we talking about? It has to be the goodwill of the Lord because that's the only one that's going to be manifested here. We're not talking about God manifesting the will of people. Like It doesn't make sense. He's manifesting his own desire, and so there's going to be peace among those people of this desire. Those people who are on his side, and how do you know they're on his side? They're on his side because they want God's desire to be done. That's what it is to pray the prayer of Matthew, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what it means to be on his side is to submit to his will, and your joy only comes when his will is manifested. That's why we have in the parable, come into the joy of your master, because your master is home. He's got his house. Everything that his master wanted and needed is here. Therefore, you get to participate in that. So the great joy that is being manifested is what he evangelized. And this whole host of angels, the host is, is an army. So we have an army of angels who are here to fight and to manifest this is a reminder of Joshua. Interesting, we have another Joshua being born in this pericope, where Joshua sees all the angels all around the hills ready to fight, ready to establish the will of their master slash general, because the master is uh, the judge, but he's also the general in front of the army. He's going to make his will manifested. As we find ourselves in this Advent season, thinking about this statement is not about us getting our will and making a Christmas list and getting the things on our Christmas list and say, no, really the gift that we get this season is Jesus. No, 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 no. We don't get the gift of Jesus this season. God is giving the gift of Jesus this season, and you may accept that gift, and you may enter into the joy of God's desire manifested on earth. And if you are evangelized with this great joy, then you may enter into the joy of your master. Thanks very much, Dr. Brenton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.